Florida native who has been writing about the Sunshine State since his father gave him a typewriter at age six. He was a columnist for the Miami Herald from 1985 until 2021, earning him three Pulitzer Prize nominations. His first novels, written in the 1980s, started with mystery thrillers for adults. Additionally, Carl has written several books for young readers, including the Newbery Honor Winning Boot. Altogether, his books have been published in 34 languages. Pretty impressive. Nyla Kudu is a journalist and broadcast, podcast host, as well as a guest host for 1A on NPR. Her broadcast career includes being the founding host of Axios Today, a daily news podcast, founding host executive producer of the 21st, an award winning daily news program for Illinois Public Radio Station, and a Afternoon shift. Nyla got her start in public radio at WLRN, the South Florida NPR station, while still a Miami Herald reporter. A Miami native, Nyla has been a journalist since 2000 for Reuters, the Associated Press, and the South Florida Sun Sentinel. It is my pleasure to turn the event over to them.
right? Like it's a comic book public. Yeah. Like how do you thought about conveying all of that? Well, I mean, in all the novels I've written, and then the ones for, for young readers as well as the ones for grown ups, I mean, Florida is almost its own character, as you know. I mean, it's more than a setting, it, it, it's, a, it's a vibe, and it's a and it's, it's such a diverse and, and, and unusual place, but there's so much rich material there. In, in Key West especially, it's hard to capture because there is the, there is the, the maritime vibe, the water, and going back generations. In record, the name comes from, it comes from a generation when, when salvage at the turn of the, the, the century, the 1900s, Key West was the richest um, municipality per capita in the country, and it was largely, uh, I mean, a little before that actually, it was largely because of the salvage industry, ships coming up on the, the coral reefs, and there was a whole industry uh, where they had special towers, and widow's walks, where people would watch at night, and you could see the ships coming up, and the whole town would go out, and the salvage, would, and they would get, they not only rescued the people on the boat, they weren't, they didn't let the people, they would rescue them, but by law, at the time, they got a percentage of what they brought back, and it wasn't gold bullion, it wasn't Bob Menendez's uh, stuff. It was, uh, most of it was uh, cotton and um, other kinds of goods like that, but it was very, very valuable. And, and so the, there was a judge in Key West, his one judge, his only job was dividing up and, 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 and which salvage ship got there first, which they got the most, and then everyone split up, and that was the industry. Uh, and so the main character record is, is basically seven generations going back, and his father was a Bahamian diver, and in the early days of Key West, they used Bahamians to dive, because it was very treacherous, there's no scoop gear. And they'd go down, and usually the cargo holes, there was oil, there was black tar, there was terrible. It was very dangerous to die. You had no protection. And they, they could hold their breath so long, and they became the most, really the most valuable crew members on those ships. The wreckers, great, 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 great grandfathers. He was very proud of that. And it lasted for generations until, and finally his own dad just, uh, uh, you know, it, it was got lost a generation of his own dad, who's a character in the novel, kind of disappears, decides at a young age he's going to be the next uh, Jimmy Buffett, and changes his name and goes off to Nashville. And it um, doesn't work out too well for him, he comes back. But, uh, but you know, it gets lost in the trans, you know, over the years, but it, he still has a great tie to that particular uh, part of his life, and he loves it on the water. And I mean, it was fun to write because. You know, Key West is still a cool place and you can still get out in the water and still say, okay, I get, I get why it's so special. Um, so you told me something once when I was a very baby reporter at the Miami Herald, and I think you came to talk to us about writing. And you said, I asked you about fiction writing, and you said, actually, the great thing about Florida and the great thing about journalism here is most of the craziest things in my book I don't have to make up. <laughs> and this is the case with one of the central conflicts in your book, which is in record, which is the people of Key West fighting the governor about cruise ships. Like this is, I want people, like when they read this, to know this is actually true. No, it's an actual true story. Um, in my lifetime, there's Key West. I mean, with, with, with Key West, and there's I don't know if they're here, but Joe Ackerman was a reporter down there for years. Knows it. In the old days, Key West. I mean, the old days. I'm going back to the 70s. Was still pretty funky. And when and Buffett moved down there and all the crews down there, but they didn't have these gigantic cruise ships come in. Now these the cruise ships come in and they're 20 stories, they're higher than any building in Key West, and they take over the whole horizon. But uh, the city of Key West gets paid for every cruise passenger that comes off, and they they're not. It's not a beloved event when the cruise ships come in. Because they're, they're, they come in, they buy a bunch of T-shirts, and they go back to eat for free on the cruise. They're not really family tourists. They're not spending a lot of money except on Duval Street. They might have a margarita, then they might go back to the boat. Anyway, they've been fighting it. And the other one thing they do is they tear up. They're huge. And when they turn around in the basins and things, they tear up all this silt and mud off the bottom that goes on the 
reefs and the, and the grass seabeds and kills them. The silt just kills coral reefs. It kills the seabeds. And the, so uh, a group of boat captains, old timers, and, and young people have been fighting this to try to get smaller and smaller cruise ships brought in so to, that wouldn't, first of all, dump that many people, but secondly, not tear up this beautiful water. There's online there, and I watched this while I was writing the book, there was a, it was a heartbreaking thing of a, a cruise ship was coming in and it was just dragging miles of a, a mud bank behind it. And a school of dolphins that had crossed from the deep blue water had come in, bottling those dolphins, and they hit the mud and they immediately start jumping as fast as they can to get out of the mud. And they're right in the wake of the cruise ship and someone on the cruise ship had taken... This picture. That scene that, that scene that you wrote in the book. That uh, yes, happens. Uh, that's what I was saying. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, you can, the conflict there is uh, both symbolic and, and real. So I wanted to get that in the book. The people of Key West, there was a referendum. There were three items concerning just reducing the size and the frequency of the cruise ships and the, and the amount of water they could draw. And they passed overwhelmingly. Uh, almost all of them, it was almost 70% of the vote. And it was it was a, a, a big fight. Now, the people that own the biggest cruise ship pier there uh, is a private pier that leases it from the city. Um, so this passes, and there's celebration in Key West, right? This passes, and uh, the, the owner of the biggest pier in Key West gives $950,000 to the campaign of a guy named Ron DeSantis, and who who goes to the legislature and they they stuff an item in the in the final budget measure for the year that says local municipality first it says no local municipalities can control their own ports and the port authorities in all these different communities said no 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 not a so they narrowed it down to just key west you can't control what comes in and out of the port to your city and it slipped in there, and it passed, and Ron DeSantis signed it. So if you're wondering about how much it costs to buy him, if you're, one of, if you're a lobbyist in town, I'm just telling you, you start at 950, it'll get you there. Uh, but I, I, put, I put that in, in the novel because it's a huge thing. They were doing these little flotillas. You know, these ships are, I don't want to say they're as big as this church because I don't think anything is as big as this church. <laughs> but... They're huge, and these, all these uh, local skippers and captains and their small boats and their whalers and their bonefish skiffs and their smaller boats are out there, and they were doing little blockades that, of course, finally the coast, to try to stop the ships from coming in. And this was really happening, and there were kids out there, everybody else, and finally the Coast Guard, the port authority called, and the Coast Guard came and cleaned them out, you know, moved away so the ships could come in. But it was a very touching moment when it happened. So there's a scene, there's a couple of scenes in the book that are that, and it's really right out of the headlines. And I just took that idea that you're trying to protect the place you love, and you're, in this case, a teenager, and all you got is this little boat with a little tiny outboard motor on it. But, you know, you're going to go out there and do the best you can. Mm-hmm. So there's another part of the book that's not from the headlines, but is from history, which is the history of the KKK in Key West and the lynching of Manuel Cabeza. Yeah. How did you first learn about this story? I, had, I forget where I first heard about it, but um, uh, the, it was a true story that happened a hundred years before the events take place. The, the book takes place kind of in, about, in, in like about 2021. It's sort of the end of the pandemic. or uh, Not that necessarily there's been an end to it, but when it was sort of abating a bit. And um, uh, in a hundred years earlier, uh, on well, on Christmas Eve of of, of two thousand and uh, I mean of of um, nineteen twenty, ain't that long ago, by the way? Um, a, a man named Manuel Cabeza was lynched by the KKK. Well, first he was shot and beaten and taken out of jail and dragged through the streets a bump on the bumper of a car. They tied him to a bumper of a car and they took him out and they hung him off of a, st- a street light on Flagler Avenue where you know, you know that is one of the main north-south dra- drags in Key West and uh, killed him. And, uh, and it was a racial lynching. And what people, he, he, his crime, his sin, 
was that he lived with and was in love with a woman of, of mixed race. And the town disapproved of that. So the day before that had happened, they had come to his house. He, he ran a bar. He was, a, he was, by the way, a military veteran. He had served for the United States in, 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 in World War I and come back to Key West. He, he had served uh, in, uh, honorably in the military. And he arrives home to this. Uh, and anyway, they had... They disapproved of his relation. And at the time, the Klan, people don't, when you think of Key West, you think of, you know, Margaritaville. But at the time, Key West, Key West, in the early 20s, the whole town, the whole island was run by the KKK. Um, uh, the, 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 the mayor of Key West, the mayor of Monroe County, the police chief, the sheriff, uh, uh, several of the judges, the tax collector, they were all members of the Klan. And they would joke and say that it was it was like the, the, we're the chamber of commerce of Key West in the twenties. So they had torn, they had taken Manuel Cambeza the night before, and they had taken him to the edge of town. They had beaten him, broken several bones in his body, and they had tarred and feathered him. But he was a fighter. He was a very rough and tumble guy, and he had torn the hood off one of the Klansmen and recognized him. So the next day, he was in miserable pain. His body was broken. Next day, he got a gun, and he, and he tracked down one of the Klansmen, uh, who, was a, who also he was a business owner there, and he, and he shot him dead on Main Street. Now, granted, that, that's a homicide. You shouldn't do that, but the guy, what he had been through. So he was arrested. They put him in jail. Uh, and they had uh, they brought in marines to guard the jail and about midnight the sheriff told everybody guarding the cells to go home and the clan came in and, and they killed him and they well, I mean, they hung him from the tree the the sheriff said everybody go home and let this happen but this was not that again it was 100 years ago and it one of the characters in the novel one of the, the young people in the novel has a generational connection to that event and it is haunting her years and years later. And Manuel Cabeza is buried in the, in, the key, in the old Key West graveyard. They finally, this was just a few years ago, they, gave him, they got a military headstone. He'd been put in a, a corner, and, and my wife Katie and I had spent a lot of time in the cemetery Dur- during the day, not at night. Uh, the, the, several of the scenes in the novel take place at night, but I didn't really... I want to jump the fence. Unlike your character. <laughs> yeah. They, Wrecker has no problem jumping the fence. But um, anyway, so um, his grave is there. And, um, and, and when we saw it, and where they tucked it, it's still there. And it's still, and people still, he was honored at least many, many years, so many years after after he died. And in researching the, the, the in that cemetery, I found, there was a lot of other stuff that was very interesting. It's very historic. A hurricane had had torn up the cemetery at one point, and all the coffins and everything were floating. So they moved the cemetery to the highest point in Key West called Solaris Hill. It's the one point that doesn't flood when there's any kind of a tropical system. It's, it's kind of up on a high level hill. But, um, and I, another example, which I mentioned in the novel, and this is probably all going to get the book uh, banned in Florida. Because, but that was because, my next question. Yeah, <laughs> because it's actual history. Was, um, there was, was a, bl- a black sheriff's deputy uh, during this period of time um, who was trying to arrest a violent guy right on, on one of the main streets of Key West, and, and he was shot and killed. And um, they, he was, when a police officer is killed, you know the, the, the ceremony and, and, the, and, the, and the amount of attention, as it should be. Well, he was buried in an unmarked grave, and um, it took years and years for them uh, the historical society that had found, and his his own family couldn't be buried next to him because they didn't know where he was in the cemetery. He was a sheriff's deputy. He was killed in the line of duty, <laughs> and that was the time. So th- there's, as I said in the novel, there's generational connections to what happened back then. And um, it's not indoctrination. It's actual history. It's what actually happened. And there are people living on that island who's 
you know, whose relatives, going back those generations, had connections to those events, and they live with that knowledge, and that was kind of what the characters in the book mm-hmm. are doing. So that is a really difficult history that you just went through there. How do you think about that when this is a novel for younger readers? Like, did you think about how you would approach writing that and sharing that story? You know, at the time, first of all, I have a lot of faith in young people. Uh, I think they can handle any kind of story. But I wanted them to, to feel what it would be like to be in the shoes of a young person growing up in Key West now. And, and in Wrecker's case, his history was um, uh, his history went all the way back, well the way back to Africa. His his ancestors were brought to the Bahamas as as, as slaves. And and then came to key the keys to settle them and become you know successful in the salvage trade, uh, and the, the other character uh, um, who is a girl her her history is different and it, it leads back to what happened to Manuel Cambeza and but I thought there are kids that are living this so uh, you have to write about it or you should write about it. Um, and and uh, I, I think it's a dangerous thing when you start deciding that uh, uh, somebody's going to be damaged or indoctrinated or warped by history because history is what it is, and we all have to cope. All of us have to cope with our uh, the history of this country and what's going on. There's no way to cope with the future and deal with what's coming mm-hmm. if, if we don't. So when I ask you this question, I am definitely not discounting the value of a public school education because I am a proud product of Miami-Dade County Public Schools. But how important is it, do you think, that these books, like that these conversations are happening outside of a school setting, that this is that these topics are happening, like that kids are reading about it or maybe talking about it with friends? And, and I'm thinking not just about history, but about, like, I know, I mean, like a lot of the book is a passionate plea for protecting the environment of the keys. So all of, I'm just kind of curious to what you think the value of that is. I, I mean, you, you, I think when, when I write these books or when anyone writes books for kids, you hope that there's conversation or you hope that there's thinking, but I mean, there's no agenda. It's just, in my mind, this is a good story. It really happened. And everything that's happening in the novel and there, and because it's the end of the pandemic, there's a, uh, 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 an element of the pandemic. Uh, the, the Wrecker's steps, stepfather will not wear a mask, and he the, he begs him to please. Um, he won't get vaccinated. And he won't get vaccinated. And and Key West was one of the places in Florida that was ravaged uh, uh, when 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 the, the pandemic was at its height. And and this is something thousands of kids in Florida and and daughters and sons went through was seeing older relatives be taken to ICU and not being able to see. We had 85,000 deaths in Florida from, from the pandemic. So this, that was just real. It's not, mm-hmm. it's not pedantic. It's not uh, a preaching. I mean, you want, but I think those are things kids are talking about anyway. I mean, certainly that was, um, you know, you. I mean, look at the novelist's job is is pretty simple. Your job is to just tell a good story. I mean, it's it's real basic. You want people to read the book and keep turning the pages. You, I mean, you're not trying to sell an idea. At least I'm not. But I can't keep reality because the books are set. All my novels are contemporary. I mean, they're set in kind of real time or as close to real time as I can make it. So they have to reflect what's going on, and what's going on is can be chaotic at times and depressing and confusing uh, to kids too. And they are having conversations about things. I don't want to steer or guide those, but but um, and I have no. Again, it's just especially in these times we're in, where you're seeing, for instance, in Florida. I was going to ask. We have to go back to if Wrecker is going to be banned. You can answer that now, too. I, I, I suspect in, in Florida they do it by school districts. I'd be astonished if it wasn't yanked out of some of the school districts. Uh, and, and, it, and there's already, I mean, I don't know. You know, I mean, I know, I know 
uh, little uh, Red Tide Ronnie isn't a big fan of mine. Um, I used to, before I stopped the writing the column for the Herald, I had a lot of fun with, with Ron DeSantis. And, and I'm, I'm sure he's not a big fan. And, and the Florida Department of Education is now run by his folks that he's handpicked. And so they lean on local school boards a lot. He's, in, in Florida, I don't know how it is up here, but the school boards are, uh, races are nonpartisan. And they've always been nonpartisan. It's about education. It's about school. Well, he has been pushing and pushing to make them partisan races, and he's also naming school board members in individual counties he would like to replace, including one where we live in Indian River County, who's been an educator for over 30 years and on the school board in law, and a distinguished, uh, you know, uh, uh, educator. She's a teacher. She's been everything, and all she's doing is trying to do her job, but because she didn't buy into this, you know, the whole, um, his whole thing on uh, critical race theory, which she's never been able to define, by the way, and which was never taught as a class in any single Florida school, um, she was targeted by DeSantis. So I'd be, I'd be surprised if it wasn't, and I'm not going to lie, I'll be a little disappointed if it isn't. <laughs> Band. This is being recorded. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, just, can, can we say the word screw in a church? Screw them. Uh, I don't care. Um, look at, these are, these are our kids. I'm a product of the Broward County school system. Second best. Second best. Um, uh, and, uh, um, uh, you know, so is my son, who you know, Scott, and my other son was the Indian River County. I mean, look at, I never, they never brought home a book or, or talked about an idea that, that alarmed me, that thought they were being, their minds were corrupted and polluted about anything. Um, and the idea now that you've got this fear, and you see it at local school. Not a, some of the pushback on this book on Wrecker is um, one was a little school district in, in Georgia, another was North Carolina, another was Virginia, and uh, they just felt. One of them said, "Well, we think the pro-vaccine message will offend some readers." Are you out of your mind? I mean, uh, I mean, honestly. Because a kid is concerned about his stepdad getting sick. That's some sort of agenda thing. Um, and these were just events that were canceled. And, and um, to be honest, and I'm being selfish here, anything that will shorten my book tour makes me happy. <laughs> anything that l lets me go home any sooner with Katie, then I'll be happy. <laughs> but I feel bad for the kids. And I feel bad for the, these independent bookstores because, I mean, it's a big deal for them to hold these events. So I'm not, I, I shouldn't make light of it, but I know it, it's happening everywhere. Texas, the first time I ever knew a, a book of mine was banned, and it was a, a book for adults. And it, was, and it was the most unlikely of all. I've written some really twisted stuff, you know. <laughs> I mean, really b bad, depraved, twisted. And most of it was based on... Stories right. you know in real life. <laughs> so, but I remember I got a notice. <laughs> this was so great. It was from a, 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 one of the prison systems in Texas. In Texas. They, apparently, I didn't know this. My books are popular in some of the prisons in Texas. Now, I'm not going to turn down any readers I can get. But I will say from a commercial, they don't buy a lot of books in prison. <laughs> Um, so, okay, but they, they banned a book that <laughs> I did so many years ago. It was like 1980, I don't know, seven or 88, called uh, Double Whammy, which was about, <laughs> which was about, <laughs> I know, but yeah, honestly. So it was a book about murder and corruption on the professional bass fishing circuit, okay? How can you... What what is, idea is that going to plant in a in a hardened criminal's brain in the Waco uh, Correctional Institute? That I thought it was hilarious, and I was and I sent it to one of the publicists at Knopf, and I said, "Can you please can we use this in a positive way?" And I was so tickled, I felt bad 
for the prisoners, of course, that, 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 that they would be deprived. But I thought, this is fantastic, this kind of stuff. Um, and then I do remember getting... <laughs> I do remember getting a letter, and I shouldn't keep picking on Texas, but it was also from Texas, and I think it was one of the Hooter, one of the first kids' books I did. It was Hooter Flush, and uh, I got, it, was a, it wasn't to me. It was to the, to the publisher, and it was a very indignant letter saying she was taking the books out of the schools because uh, a, a, one of the young characters used the word butt, B-U-T-T, <laughs> referring to ass, Right? And, and that she was taking it out of the schools. And this was the litmus test. She goes, um, I, sh- I showed the book to some of our cafeteria staff, and they were horrified. <laughs> and I, I thought that was beautiful. You got some poor, uh, poor minimum wage slice. You know what you get in a school cafeteria, some Salisbury steak that's like a shingle. They're, and they're sh- shoving a book in front of these people. What do you think of this book? And they're, ah, it's awful. Just, you know, get, just get out of my face with the book. So I wanted that letter. I, wa- I also wanted to use that in the publicity, and I couldn't get that to work. But now, with this book, maybe there's more possibilities. So I want to get to audience questions. And remember, we, went, we would love it if a kid asked the first question. I want to ask you one last question before we get to that. Um, I just wanted to end on a different note and offer condolences for the loss of your friend Jimmy Buffett. And there's a cameo, actually, in Wrecker about his, his music, at least, makes a cameo. Um, you know, you've spoken out about how he fought through his cancer without slowing down. Um, and as I read the book, I thought about the friendships in this book are so beautiful. And I just wondered if there were any lessons you wanted to share for your friendship with him. It was nearly 40 years you all were friends? Yeah, Jimmy was a great guy. He, uh, he was everything that his song suggested he was. And uh, when I first met him, I had done a book. that was the first novel I, I wrote called Tourist Season. And it was a little... The book hadn't come out yet, but they were circulating it around Hollywood. And he had called me and said, uh, do you... Uh, can I option the book for a movie? And I said, no, it's already been, it was already optioned at the time. And he said, well, that's great. Let's get together. And we had talked a few times and, uh, and, and we became, uh, we became friends. And he, uh, part of, uh, he was just a great guy, but also he loved Florida so much and the environment so much. And he did so many things, uh, behind the scenes. And, um, and, and we had a lot of great trips and, and there were, Memories that I can share and maybe I can't share in this. I see there's some young people here. Um, but he had a really good time. Every, he just believed in, in having a good time, but he believed also in, in, uh, in, in kids. And he, and he did a book for kids. He did music for kids. He, he, was, he just believed that everything was going to be okay. Um, and, and then Trump came along. And I saw <laughs> Jimmy. Ah, don't, it'll, be, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. But he did fight through some tough times, and I was lucky to, to, to have him as my friend. And, and this particular book, let me just say the context. Um, Brecker's dad, who is just not very successful and not very motivated, he goes, he goes off to uh, Nashville, or Memphis, Nashville and, and changes his name to Austin Breakwater. And starts recording songs, and they have titles very similar to some of Jimmy's songs, and and they keep saying you can't call a song that you're going to get sued. And he says, Ah, Jimmy will never sue me. Well, I, you know, I, I I was writing this book, and Jimmy was still going pretty, st- and there was a lot of hope that he was going to be okay. But I was able to um, in the last, uh, I guess I don't know what, Katie, month, two month or six weeks. Two months before, he'd heard about the book, and, and, you know, he was having these treatments and everything. And I was able to send him an advanced copy of the book, and I said, you're in there, and you're going to appreciate, because every bad bar in Florida has uh, some guy with a guitar singing Margaritaville. 
not very well, you know. And so I sent him the book, and he was able to read it. And the last time I saw him, he talked about the book. So it was it was a kick that he at least, you know, he was he was still going strong when he read the book, and he and he gave his seal of approval to Austin Breakwater's career. So anyway, <laughs> that's a great memory. Thank you for sharing that. So. A transition over to Q and A. We're just going to set up a quick mic in the center here. We would love to have a kid ask the first question if you're so inclined, um, but we will just start a, a line behind the microphone. We're going to borrow Nyla's microphone if you don't mind. But feel free to come on up and ask questions. I'm sure that this is the part where everyone gets <laughs> terrified because look at it's a microphone. <laughs> it's a long walk. It's a long, lonely walk up that aisle. Somebody's got to go oh, first. Wait, there's a brave. I, I don't know anybody here. I'm good. Oh, we do have a, qui- a kid. I'm sorry. One, we do have a kid who oh. has a question. Yeah. I, the, you, uh, and then you. I'm uh, I'm I'm the back of the line. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you for, thank you. Hi there. Why did you want to start writing books? Why did I? Why did I start writing books? Um, it was a, a kind of a, a socially acceptable outlet for some of the things that were going on in my brain. You know, I mean, I, I, the the truth is that I was your age. I loved reading, and I thought, and every time I finished a good book, I thought that's the coolest thing. And I would look, and I would look back. This is before Google or anything, but I would look at the author's name and I would think, that, what a cool job he's got, to, or she's got, to write a book that people just want to keep turning the pages. I just thought writing would be a great gig if you can if, do it. Now, I always didn't, I have to say, I didn't think I could make a living at it. I knew when I was, as I got older, I wanted to be in the newspaper business because you could write every single day. There's no writer's block or else you have unemployment block if you're in the news. So you learn to write when you didn't feel like writing, but every day would be different. Every day would be a new story. Every day, if you're covering a a, a sewage board meeting and you've got to make that interesting, I mean, think about that. Oh, they're voting on the the bond issue for a new sewer. Can you imagine getting anybody to read that? It's not like exactly Dr. Seuss, okay? It's like, oh. T- so it, be- it was challenging, too, so it was fun. And, and I sort of, when I was young, uh, by the time I was your age, I, I was lucky. I already knew that I wanted to do that. I didn't know that I could possibly make a living at it. But it was just, I knew it was a, it just seemed like a cool thing to do. And, and, and I, I lucked out. Is that good? Uh, you, you, is there more? <laughs> she looks. Now she's leaving. Uh-oh. Uh oh. What did I, scared what did her I away. say? Hi. Hi. Um, so first of all, uh, my um, my heartfelt sympathies for the loss of your brother. But um, why do you think that both you and and Rob both became newspaper writers? That's a good question, and, and some of Rob's family is here tonight. And I always wondered about it. When, when my brother, um, uh, I don't think he first started out wanting to be a print journalist. He was interested in broadcast journalism. And ironically, I was too. I was six years older than Rob, and I started out thinking that I would be a great broadcast journalist. And not for any other reason, but I thought you could reach more people. And I loved the idea of someday writing comedy, believe it or not. I used to love to watch Johnny Carson and listen to the joke. He had a great bunch of writers and, and all that. And, uh, but I, I, when I started out I, at the university, when I was at Emory University for a couple of years as an English major, I figured out that there was, unless I wanted to teach English or go to law school, both unsavory prospects, <laughs> I, I decided... Uh, maybe, and I transferred to Gainesville and to get my journalism degree. And I had a teacher named Jean Chance, and it was Journalism 101, I never forget. And she was looking at my whole schedule, and she was You're taking a broadcast. And I said, Yeah, I think I can be a broadcaster. She goes, No, you, no, you, you'll be a terrible broadcaster. <laughs> she goes, But you could be a good journalist. And, um, 
and she was right. I, 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 did, I lasted one or two semesters in Brock. This was back before there was anything digital. So when, like in radio, for example, when you made a tape or a demo tape or when you do a new, you, you actually made the tape and you cut it with scissors and you tape it. It was like two-track tape. It was horrible. And I, I wasn't even any good. I couldn't barely tie my shoes. So I couldn't do that. And I was, I was terrible on the air. So I gravitated to print. And I, Rob started out, he was actually better on the air than I was. He had a better voice than I did. But he eventually, I, he eventually, the other thing is that there was a time, believe it or not, when um, uh, newspapers were a, a more solid career than broadcasting. I mean, it, it really was a better career choice. You had more opportunities, and he, and he did very well. And he was, went from the Palm Beach Post, the Baltimore Sun, to the Annapolis paper. But, but I, we talked about it a but lot. There was nothing, but, nothing in your growing up that, that led you that way? Pardon? There was nothing in your growing up together that led you that way? to. No. In fact, okay. we came from a family of lawyers. <laughs> I mean... Um, close, close enough. <laughs> yeah, my my dad was a lawyer, and my and our, well, our grandfather was an attorney, um, and one of the first attorneys in Florida, actually. And he he was uh, moved there from North Dakota in 1922, which you can't blame him. And uh, um, and neither Rob and this is the deal. My grandfather loved the law, and he loved he argued in front of the Supreme Court, and he loved trial work, and he loved performing, and he was a great storyteller. And my dad was a complete opposite. He was an introvert. He hated he hated going to trial. He hated he came home every day from work, and I remember this, and Rob remembers it too. He came every every day. We wait for him to get home. He get home about five thirty, and he and he looked like he had just been a, to a funeral. He had. Nothing good to say about the legal practice, anything. All he wanted was a pack of Marlboros and a, a six-pack of Pabst Blue Ribbon. And just don't ask him about work. And so we, can't, we grew up imprinted with the fact that that doesn't look like a lot of fun. <laughs> and, and, the, and to him, it wasn't. My grandfather thought it was the greatest thing in the world, but to him, it wasn't. So I think neither Rob or I was like, oh, let's go into law. It was like, oh, God, Dad's... Dad looks like he hates the world. We got to do something else. Thank you. Okay. Do you have any like uh, weird or unusual writing practices? Weird or unusual writing practices? That's almost a. I mean, uh, every writer, first of all, it's not a normal profession. <laughs> I don't. I don't care who you'd have sitting in this chair. They're deeply disturbed if you think. <laughs> Well, think about what we do. Here's what we do. We go into this room, and, and it's usually a small room, four by four. And we go in, and in the old days, we'd have a stack of whatever, 300 blank sheets of paper. Now it's blank computer screen. And your job is to sit there all day and write something that people are going to like, that they're one going to keep. You're so arrogant that you think you're going to write something that people are dying to read. That's how messed up you are. Oh, <laughs> The whole world can't wait to read that sentence. And then you write the sentence, and, and you want to jump off the building. But there isn't a normal person who, at least as a novelist that I've ever met, and I, and I know some great, I mean, and they're lovely. Uh, I mean, if Steve King, Stephen King were sitting here right now, would you ask him that question? Do you have any weird, just look at what the man writes. And he's one of the nicest guys and smartest dudes you'd ever meet in your life. Terrible guitar player, excellent writer. But we're all twisted. I mean, we all live in this world where when we're starting a book, you create all these characters. You put these characters on this little stage in your brain. And, and they live there, and they fight, and they, they make trouble for the whole duration of the time you're writing. It's like having a family of miscreants loose in your brain, and while you're going to have, trying to have a normal life. I mean, you, you go home at the end of the day, they're, they're supposed to shut down. They're supposed to knock it off. They don't. And so uh, you can't be normal in that. I don't think you can be a normal person and be a writer, and it's not easy to, 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 to be in a family where there's a writer. I think I look back... I, and I wish, you know, when I was a reporter, when I started, I would, come, I would work at the Herald all day, and I would go home and work on novels at night, and I, 
I do regret some of the time I missed with my uh, with with one of my sons, my oldest son. Uh, and then, and then what does he do? He grows up and he becomes a reporter. I told him, I, I got to tell you, I told the guy, dude, no, there's a million other jobs. And he loved it. And then the, the newspaper, and then what does he do? He becomes a lawyer. <laughs> Just go ahead, stab your dad in the back. It's all right. But actually, actually, I'm very proud of him. And he is one of the normal ones. But I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Hi there. Hello. Can you can you reach that? Yeah, I can. Okay. Um. So, because I feel like in some of your earlier books, all the main characters have kind of run of the mill names, but in this book, is the main character's name is Wrecker. What kind of was the inspiration for that? Which one? I'm sorry, I had trouble understanding. Um, what was your inspiration for the name of the main character in this book? In Wrecker. Yeah. Wrecker. The, the, well, his nickname is because his great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, well, that's what they call people in the trade who went out to salvage the ships when they crashed on the reefs at night. They called them wreckers. And there were different crews, and there were all these boats that were in Key West that were set up to leave immediately, especially, and, and it was always in stormy weather, so you have to realize that all these, they were jumping on the boat. They are going out into 10, 12-foot seas, because that's when the ships crashed, and they were they were called wreckers. They were considered very brave, and many died because the the seas they were going out and that they would go out and anchor up and then jump on the boat that had sunk or wrecked and start unloading the the you know the goods from it. And so Wrecker himself was always very proud of that heritage, and he wanted to be called his, his, uh, in the novel his mom isn't crazy about the nickname because it goes back so many generations and it sounds like it means something else but that's where the name came from and I, the other thing is I had read a couple books when I was researching this book um, that were one of them and I can't remember it was uh, Wreckers of the I don't want to say Wreckers of the Florida Keys but the title of the book and it was all stories about the wreckers, and, and that's how, in lore, they always referred to them as that. So I just, that's where the nickname came from. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi there. Uh, I've been reading your books from the very, very beginning, uh, but I came here for a different reason tonight. I, um, on the morning we all found out that Buffett died, um, I just wanted to thank you for that Instagram post. It was so touching, so heartfelt, so poignant. Um, I mean, I could just see the Martin guitar leaning against the palm tree. Yeah. And um, I wanted to thank you for that. Thank, thank you. Yeah, it was hard to write. I bet. It was I bet. hard, it was it hard was, to read. Uh, I'm sorry, but it was, it was him. He was, uh, he was really bigger than life. Thank you for that. I, I'm not great on social media, but I'm trying to get better. And, and, um, and uh, you know, well, that we was do, a stellar moment. Well, we knew he would, at that point, we knew it was going to be, you know, any day. And so I'd started working on it, but it was hard to be, because, and then when it happened, it was really hard. But thank you for saying that. Yeah. You're welcome. Thanks. Hi. Well, first off, I'm actually from Florida. Um, so, yeah, a lot of your books deal with current issues. And, I mean, I still visit a lot. I, still, I live here now. But once a common complaint I hear from friends and family down there is the cost of housing, how it's completely out of control. People are being, you know, priced out of the neighborhoods. So, but, like, housing in Florida is among the least affordable in the country. So is that a topic you've thought about exploring uh, at some point? Some point? Cost of housing? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's pretty uh, punitive everywhere. But yeah. Florida is especially bad. But um, it's it's not... It's such a, a universal thing, and I think it's also uh, governed by forces that are not necessarily lend themselves to the kind of books I write. I mean, the economic forces are great, and then, you know, for, well, for instance, in the town of Key West, and this is true in a lot of resort towns, the, the folks who work there can't afford to live there. They all uh, commute from islands way up the island chain that long commutes, spend a lot of money on gas to come back and forth because the housing in Key West is ludicrous. I mean, but that's true in Aspen. 
it's true in a lot of towns that are tourist destinations is that they've been priced. I, I lived in Isla Mirada for years, which is up the Keys a ways, and they would bus. I mean, it was sad because it got put. No one could afford the. They would send buses to up to the mainland of Florida City and Homestead every day to get workers because that's the only place they could afford to live and they drive down and work in the hotels and the resorts and the restaurants every day and they'd get on a bus for a two hour bus ride back so this has been going and this is going back years I don't have an answer for it I don't even begin to understand how it makes sense to, to price workers out of, uh, out of a service economy like you have in the Keys or you have in any nice place but it's I gotten, don't yeah, it's gotten worse but yeah, it, it will. It's going. I think it was going to get worse. But anyway, thank you. Good. Yeah, how hard it is to how hard it is to live. Their record lives with um, with his uh, uh, sister and um, uh, stepsister. But it's very hard. Uh, you see, in the Keys, for example, people. Uh, they work in the hotel industry, and they, they, they'll get these little apart. There'll be four or five people living in a very small place and paying the most ludicrous rents you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, the, again, that's happening all over. In California, it's everywhere. So, yep. Um, do you have a favorite book about writing? There are just so many out there. A, a favorite book about writing? Yeah. Uh, like on how, uh, sort of how the... Well, so I'm thinking of, you know, everybody from S Stephen King to S Stephen Pinker and these other folks have all written these books. I mean, maybe you don't read them. I'm just curious. Stephen King's book is very good, but um, Mailer's book is also very oh, good. Okay. If It was, you know, obviously out a few years ago, but M Mailer's book was very good about writing and about... Uh, also about a little bit about the self torture of it and 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 um, the process and the grind and the hard work that it is and that 's that 's one of the most difficult things when you talk to people about it is that the the, the it 's just the 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 day to day weight of uh, trying to, uh, there's days when you can't write a sentence that, right. uh, I mean, you just nothing seems any good to you. And the, the self-doubt and the, and it was good for me to read that, that, that Mailer didn't think every sentence he wrote was uh, fantastic. He had the same kind of insecurities that almost every good writer I know has. I read an interview um, with uh, John Grisham the other day, and, and he, he's had success for a long, long time, and mm -hmm. he uh, he doesn't need to be writing novels now at all, but he loves it so much that he does. But he said the same thing that I've experienced. That it's it's very, very hard for him to go back and look at one of his old books. Uh. Because if you uh, care about writing, you're the toughest editor. On, you're, you're the hardest person on yourself. And you start reading something you wrote 20 or 25 years ago and... You're cringing and you're wincing. Now that's a that dialogue isn't good. That adjective. What was I thinking? You start beating yourself up, but but that's the process. Um, and then once in a while you'll hit a sentence, and you'll say, "Man, that wasn't bad." Or or even worse, you'll say, "God, I can't write that now. That that was I, that was so good. I can't write it now." But largely, it's just the self pummeling that goes on. <laughs> but it was it was nice to see that it even the the best. The writers have the same experience. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering about the inspiration behind your character, Skink. Skink? Oh, God. Well, for those who don't know, this was... A, he's, um, he's in the grown-up novels, and he was also in, in, in one of the kids' books. There was a, I finally got to the point where I thought I could introduce him to the youth of America. It took a while um, in that book. But Skink... It was in the book I mentioned that, that was banned in Waco, a double whammy. Um, he was first appeared in that, and I needed, this is really very literary. I, was, I had a scene where, where the protagonist of that novel is running through mangroves. He's running through the swamp in Florida, and I needed a hermit guy. He, he needed to have, a, he needed to have a, a encounter with a hermit guy, and I thought, well, what would, who would be a hermit, interesting hermit guy? And I thought, what if there, this is, is going to sound crazy, what if there had been a completely honest governor of Florida? 
I know, yeah. It's crazy. And I said, well, he would go out of his mind in the first few months. He'd go crazy in Tallahassee. It's such a corrupt place. And he'd just rip off all his clothes. He'd go run into the swamp and become a hermit. He'd live off roadkill. And that's where skin came from. And he was, uh, he was only supposed to be around for maybe a chapter or two at the most. But it, the, well, the great thing about not using an outline and about being completely disorganized is that you could do anything you want in the book. And I thought, he was on, once he was on the page, he started saying and doing stuff. And I liked him a lot. I just left him around. And that little novel, he sort of became the moral compass of that novel by the end of it. He, he was really the energy in that novel. And so I did what I, I swore I was never going to do. I, I, I bring him back now and again. Not, not in every book, but I bring him back now and again. In the, in, in the kids' book, Skink, uh, that, that I wrote, um, I think I pulled it off tastefully. He, he does things that are not necessarily what you would advise the youth of America to do. <laughs> But he's, he's being seen through the eyes of a young person who gets him and puts it in a proper perspective. So I was able to bring him on that particular stage, and I think it worked. But that, that was the inspiration. It wasn't any particular person. Uh, it certainly wasn't any real governor of Florida. Uh, but I, I, I will say that I had, let um, me see, three different governors, ex-governors, who claimed that they were the inspiration for... <laughs> Crazy, but you know, um, and they weren't. And I didn't want to break their hearts. Uh, they were retired, but I thought, oh, you got to be kidding me! No. So, but anyway, that's where it, came. it just came because I needed a hermit dude. So that was that simple. <laughs> Thanks. So we have time for one more question. I'm going to be mindful. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. We. I just want to be mindful. I'm sorry, but you'll have a chance. We have a signing line afterwards, oh. so I have a chance to chat oh. with him afterwards. But this will be our last question, uh, and then we will transition into sorry, a signing sorry, line. Sorry, sorry, I know so many good questions. If you get I'm in sorry. line, I'll, I'll talk to you in line. I know, I know. These people aren't going quietly either. <laughs> Wait, one more, right? Yeah, yes, yes, yours. Okay. What advice would you give to a brand new, recently published author for breaking through and getting your story out there so it can be read? It's, it's a hard thing. I'll say that it's probably harder now than when I started out um, because uh, there were many more publishers, and, and I mean major publishers, and now it's been condensed and uh, they're, they're more consolidated. And so when I started out, and, the, the, and I... I the same advice that I got, my, the advice I was given was find a good agent. And that was critical. And um, because the agents know the market, and they know the marketplace. They know which publishers like certain kinds of books. Certain publishers you have no chance with. They just don't do the kind of book. But I didn't know that. I mean, we were, we were reporters. I, was, I did a couple of novels with a dear friend of mine, Bill Monlebano, that were sort of traditional thrillers when we started out. We got them all three published. But the, uh, uh, Pete Hamill, was a, 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 the great New York journalist, was a good friend of mine. And I had I'd said, Pete, and I knew he'd published novels. And he said, you, you've got to get a good agent. I'm going to send... I'm going to send, send your book to my agent, who is a big shot agent. And the th- big shot agents aren't going to read you know, five chapters from a couple of nobodies. So they, she gave it to her assistant, who was, who was now the literary director of, of CAA and has been my agent since 1979. So it, it all worked out. And she sold the book in about three weeks. And I'll never forget, Bill, we did five chapters. Bill, the only reason he wrote the book is Bill needed a swimming pool. He lived in Coral Gables, and he said, his wife Rosie wants a swimming pool. Do you think we can get some money for a book? So we do five chapters of this thriller. And then Esther calls and says, hey, I sold your book. I called Bill, and he, and he said, he said, I won't say what he said. He said, does this mean we got to finish it? And I said, yeah, now we got to finish it. <laughs> but anyway, the key, it, it really helps to get a good agent. And uh, I always tell people, like, literary marketplace, writer market, writer's marketplace, they, they actually break down, or they used to, which agent specialized in which kind of books, and you can reach out directly to a certain agent or agency. And it really helps to to get you in the door at a, at a good publishing house. It's just, it's like beating your head against the wall. I won't tell you that it's easy. It isn't easy, but, but it can be done. Thank, thank you all. I'm sorry I had, we had to cut you off. Thank you. <laughs>